BU SS4 Research Theme 2015 Manufacturing in the UK BU SS4 BU SS4 is a synoptic paper. This means that it requires you to make the links from your knowledge and make sure that you apply and evaluate your knowledge to ensure that you use the research topic as a basis for all your application and evaluation in this first section of the exam. This presentation has been designed to give you my brief overview of the topics and themes and you will need to carry out some more additional research to ensure that you've got enough knowledge to get going for the exam. This is just purely a starting point. I've got plenty of BUSS4 resources and links online on my website bbusinessb.co.uk where you can find lots and lots of videos and presentations for that but this is just a good starting point. Let's start with the first topic. Manufacturing in the UK is your research theme this year for BUSS4. What we're going to look at in this presentation is the areas that you are asked to do some additional research for. So the impact of technological change on businesses manufacturing in the UK, the impact of increasing globalisation on businesses manufacturing in the UK, the impact of government policy on businesses manufacturing in the UK, the factors affecting UK location decisions by manufacturing businesses and the opportunities and threats facing manufacturing businesses in the UK. So let's start with the first area and let's look at how the impact of technology has on manufacturing businesses in the UK. Technology has had a massive impact on manufacturing in the UK. If you go back many years and we're talking the sort of pre-industrial revolution, the UK was obviously growing at a rapid rate and was one of the hearts of the industrialisation of the world. However, then in the 80s and 90s we found that manufacturing was moving overseas, it was what's called outsourcing and we did this typically because it was cheaper to go to what we said was LEDCs, less economically developed countries. As a result of this the UK became more service driven, typically due to consumer change and cultural change and people wanted to earn more money which came about by being in the tertiary sector. The minimum wage of course has also made it more likely that people are going to move into that tertiary sector because it feels like it's more beneficial to business organisations. As a result of that though, you tended to find that we need to look at new ways to be more competitive and a lot of that's come down to technology. Bear in mind that financially technology has an impact on a business. It's a large expenditure for a business organisation. Such vast expenditure can have a capital resource tied up in a business. As a result of that, you've got to think about where that money comes from, and that's where your finance links that there. Only large organisations are typically able to invest in such heavy, intensive machinery, which reduces the overall unit cost and obviously makes manufacturing in the UK more productive. Of course, some of the methods that are used is JIT, just in time. The reason that JIT has been beneficial to businesses is because it reduces the size of your factory and your floor space required. Because you reduce the amount of space you need, you pay less overheads. You have less rent, you have less cost of heating your building. You, you tend to find that your business becomes more successful by the fact that it's smaller but more efficient. And again, JIT is something that's been used by many, many companies now. I mean, you, you won't find many manufacturers like your Bentleys or your Jaguar Land Rovers. Everything is JIT just in time. Of course, JIT has potential drawbacks. Think about the other side, the arguments. If you've got traffic delays on major roads, that can impact on JIT. You've got to make sure you've got enough stock in the building to carry on production. You don't want production to stop because you can't get your products in there. At the same time, do you want to be held to ransom by suppliers? You need to have good, tight contracts in place, legal resources to be tied up closely to make sure that happens. You've got your CAD, computer aided design. And of course, that's benefited businesses because they make quicker prototypes now. So businesses tend to be more responsive to changes in market demands and market needs. And then because of that, you've got internet communications and of course you can outsource some of these areas. So you can outsource your CAD to a design agency. People who are specialised in producing that work. Because they specialise, they've got the skills. Yes, it costs you more money in the short term maybe to have that done, but in the long term it saves you a vast amount of money because you're paying specialists who can deliver that skills and that base. And CAD, of course, can be done in many different areas of business. You can even get economies of scale out of this because if you're a log large organisation, you might have a design team that works within your global group and, of course, you can employ them to work on certain projects for your own business. And then you've got CAM, Computer Aided Manufacturing or Automation. And, of course, this is what many of us have seen, so productions, factories. And, of course, because we've got production lines, we see improved efficiency. You see reduced unit costs. And because we do that, you also see reduced labour costs because you don't need as many employees. Typically in most businesses, employees are 80% of your costs because that goes on wages. 
and because of that you tend to find that businesses have become more competitive being a more globally competitive means that you can hopefully export your products overseas which is good for the UK economy because it brings money in but at the same time it also means that the UK is now able to compete with some of the countries who are typically seen as having lower labour costs but maybe not as highly skilled workforce so technology has been able to start to compete when it comes to manufacturing even though we've got things like the minimum wage and we've got registration which maybe is counting you would think against countries uh, companies in this country operating but actually it can be a real successful factor let's look at an example Nissan in Sunderland Sunderland's Nissan plant is the UK's largest car plant it's actually one of the most productive factories in Europe when it comes to making cars Nissan actually invested 3.5 billion pound in the plant now think about this robotics is what mainly will produce the cars so that money there that they've invested will typically be on robotics automation process, just-in-time processes that are all in place. They made 511,000 cars in the UK in 2012. This is a serious plant. They actually employ 11,000 people. Now, JIT is critical to their overall success of their business because they need to have a small as possible in stocks. So they don't want to type cash in stock, but you need to use most of your floor space for producing cars and making sure that you're making the maximum potential out of every single space that you've got in that area. Of course, what they do is the, the Nissan whole project in Sunderland was actually really clever because the area's got high structural unemployment. It's an old shipping area where they've got lots of manufacturing skills, but they couldn't actually use them. Of course, Sunderland, being the area it was, hadn't really developed that quickly in the service sector so Nissan spotted that gap and they arrived there taking on a lot of the old ex shipping workers who got those manufacturing skills they were able to tap into them and recruit them fairly cheaply the I say it because actually those people wanted a job they, they got the skills they wanted a job in that industry and they were willing to work for Nissan and of course as a result Nissan was able to use a highly skilled workforce with some fantastic robotic technology to be able to ensure that as a company they can compete but also be one of the best in Europe. So it just shows that you can actually produce cars in the UK and it's believed that Nissan even sells some of those cars back to Japan where they come from. Of course, what you've got to think about there is that everything in here is dependent on the UK government offering support to Nissan. Nissan do benefit from financial grants. Nissan benefit from us being a member of the European Union. All these things do benefit the fact that we have free trade with the European Union. Nissan can sell their cars into Europe by taking advantage of the UK. So there are so many different factors that impact on this. That's just a short example to get you thinking about it. So now let's have a look at globalisation. How has globalisation impacted on UK manufacturing? Well, you've got positives and you've got negatives. Typically, the positives are you've got access to new markets. So you've got your BRICs, your Brazils, your Russias, your Indias, your Chinas. You can tap into new markets you can all get into, as well as the European Union, which, of course, you've got free trade between all European Union members. So fantastic. Tap straight into them. You're also going to see then, as a result of that, from the UK economy point of view, you're going to reduce your balance of payments. Hopefully, you're going to start exporting more because manufacturing is becoming more competitive. As a result of becoming more competitive, then we can export more products, and that obviously brings down our balance of payments. It means we're getting more money coming in from exports than what we're sending out of our economy by buying in imports. It's creating more employment in the UK. Globalisation, by selling more products, naturally creates more products. But actually, globalisation means that we get new investment in the UK. So, for example, Tata Motor Group, who bought Jaguar Land Rover. They're an Indian company who expanded due to globalisation, and they actually kept the car plant in the UK. So, as a result of that, you can argue they've created employment. They've kept it in the business. Globalisation is bringing about that. It creates inward investment. It creates more money being invested in the UK. These companies like Tata who start to buy into the UK are starting to invest within the UK. They're helping us to grow as an economy. They're helping us to keep diversifying as an economy and making sure that we're competitive. But of course, a lot of this is brought about, remember, by the technology it's being invested in. Ultimately, it all reduces the unit cost overall. So the globalisation and the sharing of skills and the sharing of knowledge means that overall business is reducing unit costs, which of course reduces the selling price or increases profit margins. Depends how you want to look at it. So from a consumer point of view, you could argue that it actually makes products cheaper. And there is evidence to suggest that products are now a lot cheaper than they ever have been before. However, on the same side, you could also argue that it enables companies to maximise their profits. Something like Apple do quite happily with their iPhone. And of course, it gives the consumer increased levels of choice. Again, something which is fantastic from a customer's point of view. 
maybe not so good from a business point of view because it then leads into the obvious argument on the other side which is all about increasing competition if you've got increased competition then effectively you may have to reduce your price or you have to invest more heavily in new technology to reduce your unit costs so that you can increase your profit margins and of course globalization means that your competitors may no longer be in the UK they could be anywhere in the world which means they may have different labor laws or different laws in general to even comply with which may hinder their business in the UK more than it hinders a business outside of the UK of course then that means that we could potentially end up increasing our balance of payments so if we start to import more items because they're more competitive overseas and we have a tendency to want to bring them in because consumers want them then of course that might mean we're getting more imports and exports and as a result it has a massive effect on our economy remember that importing effectively is taking money out of our economy so we don't want to be dependent on that and that's a problem we've got in this country at the moment about our balance of payments it has been starting to get better however we're still a deficit overall which is a slight problem you can have this risk of being dependent on large employers and a dependency on large employers can cause a real problem because then if they threaten to leave then the government tends to be held to ransom to ensure that it offers some sort of grant or some sort of incentive to remain in the UK that was a claim to be the case with General Motors in Liverpool the Vauxhall factory when they were thinking about whether they close a plant in Germany or the UK it was relieved that both governments were basically trying to offer incentives to stay there and of course in the end they chose to stay in the UK there were reports out at the time which I'm you know feel free to go on Google and actually look it up yourself but it does quote figures about how much it costs per employee to keep them in the job however the knock-on effect is if you don't pay that then do you want areas of high unemployment because think about the knock-on effect to the economy of not doing that you know there's, these things all have a knock-on effect to remember that manufacturers tend to use suppliers in the local area cost more money brings in more revenue it's all very topically linked together government manufacturing policy the government is obviously quite keen to drive manufacturing again in the UK it realizes that we've done a lot of importing and we've seen a lot of our industry go overseas but as a result of this we've got a service sector based industry and economy but of course that means we have lots of imports and we need to get more exports so we get our balance of payments down so the government's tended to be trying to help with reshoring. Now reshoring is trying to get people to come back. So when they were outsourcing, now we're trying to bring them back into the UK. It is estimated by the UK figures at the moment that 1,500 businesses have actually come back to the UK. Typically this is starting to happen because places like China are starting to see inflation, wage inflation, as their economies start to grow, people actually demand more, and as a result it's now starting to increase costs. As a result of that, it's making it less competitive because you don't have the same control that you've got over there. And you've got the shipping costs and you've got to think about the manufacturing processes. So all these things are now making it less competitive, especially now we can invest in technology in the UK. The government's also now started to fund things like the STEM subjects, that they call. So they're trying to look at having apprenticeships in STEM subjects and trying to encourage that. For a business point of view, that's great because you start to be able to shape the future employees you need and the way you want them to operate. They've also developed these things called enterprise zones. Now, you've got one in South Staffordshire, the I-54 area, where you've got Jaguar Land Rover who've looked at it, and you've got Amazon here based there. Okay, they're a service sector business, but they've all taken advantage of enterprise zones. They've got lower taxes. They've got grants. They've got government support. You're normally close to good levels of infrastructure, like the main roads, so you can get access to them. These have got, like, super-fast broadband. All these things are all there, given to you straight away. I mean, the claim is that it will create 3,000 new jobs in total, the Jaguar Land Rover move will. So you can see that these things are meant to be good for the economy and also good for the UK in general. You've also got like EU regionalisation grants and regeneration grants. And specific areas of the UK, such like the Stoke-on-Trent and the pottery industry, have been able to tap into this. So these are areas of deprivation, ones that have got structural unemployment, where maybe manufacturers have moved out of the past and there's now funding to bring back and support businesses that want to create growth in those areas so there is funding there the government's reduced corporation tax down to 20 percent it's now the lowest figure in the g20 that means that we're more likely to get in with investment so hopefully our overseas companies are going to invest in the uk and choose the uk because they pay only 20 percent corporation tax as opposed to a much higher rate in germany or france again trying to bring them into the uk create wealth and growth in the uk 
you've got this thing called a, a patent box now, or a patent box, depending on how you want to say that word, where effectively you only pay 10% tax if you are exploiting or developing patents. So it's trying to encourage creativity, trying to encourage new growth. The government seems to be keen to try and develop and protect ideas and create businesses again, which are going to lead the way, not just in the UK, but internationally. Again, bringing up exports like Dyson, for example, who's very keen on this idea. You've now got this um, £100 tax relief for creative and high-tech industries. So it's actually effectively trying to give you some sort of relief and some sort of break on your tax. So it's just tax breaks, really. They're giving for anybody investing in this area. Your relaxation in labour laws and business regulation. This government's tried to reduce business regulation and business labour laws. You can imagine that these things are all debatable and topical, but there has been some movement. It made it easier, for example, to make people redundant. That can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. From a business point of view, it's great. From a consumer or an employee point of view, it's not so good. Of course, it creates more unsecure elements of your job. As a result of that, maybe you feel less motivated. You can link that in with your motivational theories. Regulation-wise, they say they've cut red tape. Again, this depends on who you ask. Many businesses will cite examples on either side. This is where your research and your Googling will come in quite nice. And they've been tied to controls on union power and they want to go even further they want to make it even more difficult now for unions to hold ballots for example you need they want to move to a step where 50 percent of the members have to vote if they want to strike so again they're trying to move it more in favor of businesses and as a result of this it makes it more appealing for you to invest in the uk okay factors affecting location manufacturing businesses tend to want to choose locations and able to have the lowest unit cost and they offer the optimum location for what they produce. This depends on the sort of company you've got. So it depends where you want to be. I mean, typically grants from the enterprise zones is one of the areas that might drag you in. Because grants are free money, effectively, for doing something. So it's attracting you to invest in the business. You might find that the infrastructure, the main roads, are the main calling point for your business. If you want to have good connections, it might be where you want to locate. It could be the actual area of the UK. For example, Stoke-on-Trent has been quite a lucky place when it comes to attracting the service sector more so because the location next to the main roads and in the middle of the UK has dragged more people to invest in this area than be able to get out to like places like Manchester and Birmingham and Nottingham really easily and out to North Wales but of course you might want to be close to Birmingham for example you might want to be close to your suppliers but again you need the infrastructure links being in place to ensure that you can do this successfully the skills of the employees, like I mentioned before, what skills exist in an area is a high level of structural unemployment you can tap into so that you can actually tap into these skills. And as a result, maybe the average wage in the area is a bit lower, so you can tap into highly skilled workers for a lot less than you normally pay elsewhere. Again, you might look at the average wage. So you might tend to locate a manufacturing business, and it typically happens more northern in the UK because the north south wage gap as they talk about in the south it seemed to be very expensive a lot of service sectors where the more northern you move the midlands area the northern areas tend to be more manufacturing based and of course as a result of a lower average wage but they tend to be more higher skilled employees and of course where's your customer located so you might look at where your customer located because you want to be close to your customers to make sure that you can deliver the product on time and when they require it another factor you may want to look at is your competition you may want to be close to your competition to ensure you know what they're up to and being able to tap in again to the same contracts, the same suppliers that they use. There's many, many factors you can tap into when it comes to location. Okay, opportunities and threats facing UK manufacturing organisations. There are many, many opportunities. For example, you've got access to global markets and emerging markets like your BRICS we mentioned before. To trade freely with EU member states. That's a massive, big benefit. Anybody in the EU you can trade freely with. As a result, you don't pay any tariffs or any quotas. So from a business point of view, it makes sense to locate in a country that's going to be in the EU member area, but also highly competitive. You've got the ability to tap into skilled and educated workforces when in areas typically where we said we've had high unemployment because maybe manufacturers moved out of them areas and they've got a lower than average income. So these are the areas of manufacturing, as we talked about before. These are the really good areas for businesses to tap into. Skills are all there. The workforce is fairly educated. And all you've got to do is pay them back to minimum wage and they will come and work for you. And combine that with technology and you've got a perfect workforce. You've also got the ability to tap into free movement of labour, what the EU brings. So the European Union's got the free movement of labour, which again is one of the perks of being in the EU, because it means you can bring in extra workers from outside who might have the skills that meet the requirements of your business. 
you've also got the advantage of being competitive stroke business friendly legislation in the UK. The UK tends to try and support business and hope it grows. So you tend to find we're more competitive than most of our European neighbours. Typically that comes from the sort of conservative approach that we have when we come to politics, uh, which is, of course is more topical at the moment with it being a general election year. You've got a stable economy which shows signs of recovery and consumer confidence. We are one of the fastest growing economies at the moment. You know, we are one of the strongest economies in the European Union at the moment. As a result of that, it, it tends to see that companies want to invest in here because they see that people feel confident they're going to spend more money because the economy is growing, they feel happier. As a result, you know, this it, it tries to attract more inward investment. Of course, at the moment you've got this sort of cultural need and this change culturally. So people, consumers are now sort of looking to buy British. So as a result, of this you can tap into this buy British approach and obviously tapping into the needs of the customer and the fact that they want to hopefully buy into this idea that something's made in this country, something's localism, more environmentally friendly. As a result of being in the UK, you tend to have a more control over the manufacturing process. Remember what we said about when people were reshoring to the UK? It gives them tighter control on what's actually happening. You're not reliant on what's happening overseas. You know when your products will arrive. You've got more control over those variables that could impact on your business, like transportation costs. And, of course, in the UK now, we are deemed to be one of the fastest growing countries when it comes to broadband speed in the EU. We've got some of the fastest broadband speeds in the Western world. OK, we can't compete with some of our neighbours who have invested heavily, but we are spending billions and billions of pounds in growing the speed of broadband because the government is keen to try and see businesses thrive through this new marketplace of online, of course, again, enabling access to larger markets. Of course, there are some threats facing UK manufacturers. So, for example, we said before about globalisation, because globalisation means you've got more competition. Maybe overseas, countries that have got lower minimum wages, less labour laws, so they're less restrictive. As a result of that, it means they can compete more freely. And, of course, that then means that as a country, we're going to be more likely to import their products, which, of course, has an impact on our balance of payments here before. The EU free trade, for example, that can be a potential threat, because it does mean that anybody in the European Union can do exactly the same to us. They can freely trade, they can sell their products without any quotas and tariffs into our marketplace. Of course, that has a massive impact on businesses trying to compete in this country. And again, you're then held to what laws are in place within the EU. There is no actual common set of laws in the EU. Every country within their reason can adapt them. There are certain laws you have to adopt, but not every single law. So there are some localisation. That means you can be more competitive in certain areas. Of course, you've got the threat that governments potentially can be held to ransom by large multinational organisations. So if you are dependent on large manufacturers who are investing in the UK, then they'll want grants. You've got to give them the grants. You've got to give them the incentives. And of course, then you've got to weigh up what is the knock-on effect if you don't do that. How many jobs will be lost? What's the knock-on effect to the economy? So governments can be held to ransom by multinational organisations. You could see that you've got larger overseas markets or you've got larger companies taking over or merging and of course as a result of that you tend to find that reduced competitiveness of course from a business point of view that enables greater economies of scale it enables to lower the unit costs but of course it tends to see profit margins increase it get less competition the price can start to increase so you've got to see it from both sides of the angle from a business point of view it's a great move from a business consumer point of view it's not the best move but of course a government is tends to be fearful now that that's going to happen it seems to be happening more and more all the time Manufacturers tend to be being bought up by some of our large rivals. For example, like we said before, Tata, who bought Jaguar Land Rover, they also own Tate & Lyle, the sugar company. So you see now that your larger companies, MG, owned by Shanghai Automotive. So all these companies are starting to buy in and increase their size. You've got currency fluctuations. So you've got to be careful about when you want to sell overseas, what's happening to the exchange rate. Is it a strong pound or a weak pound? So remember, the stronger pound imports cheaper exports, dear with the spice model. So you've got to think about what's happening with our currency. Is it favouring our manufacturers? Protection. How do you protect your ideas? In a global marketplace, it's more difficult to protect your ideas that you've got because not every country has the same intellectual property rights that protect you, especially countries like China who claim to have such rights but are not going to enforce them as tightly as maybe people expect. Knock on effect of that of course is that you can then start facing competition from overseas for a product that you've got the skills and the expertise to make but it's been copied and there's very little you can do about it. 
of course, you've got the strange UK infrastructure in sort of places in the UK. We all know roads and railways which are congested. And, of course, as a result of that, it can have a massive effect on your business. You know, the manufacturers talk about lorries being delayed. And, of course, remember about just in time, how that delays that, but the cost of fuel. If you want to lower your unit cost, you can't afford for things to go wrong. It works on maximum efficiency. So in some areas of the UK, we have got severe problems with infrastructure. We need to invest in there. And, of course, again, that causes problems to the government because where does it get that money from? Where does it invest that money from? But, of course, that tends to come from taxation. Do they have to tax businesses more? Do they tax consumers more? What's a knock-on effect to the economy? Think about all these links that go together. Then, of course, you've got changes in legislation, changes in the government, changes in EU policy, all these things you can't control, but potentially they can happen. Legislation can be changed because, like I say before, we've got a, legis- we've got a government coming up, and obviously, uh, sorry, an election coming up, and we're going to elect a new government, which, of course, could then have a new set of laws. The EU, of course, themselves can set new policies and new agendas and the massive effect they can have on businesses. All these things have a massive knock-on effect on how you operate your business. Search for the following questions. So what's happened to UK manufacturing over the last four to five years? Which organisations have reshored to the UK and any reasons why? I've definitely got a video on my YouTube channel that covers this, so you might want to watch that. It certainly would help you with that. How many potential customers are there in the EU, the USA and China? What are the weaknesses of manufacturing overseas? And of course, who are the largest manufacturers in the UK? So you've got some examples and there's some facts about them, a little bit of stats. Not too much, because you're not being tested on your stats, tested on how you can apply your knowledge. But of course, that can help you to build up some support and some knowledge. Presentation being useful. Don't forget to follow me on my Twitter page, it's at BBusinessB, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash BBusinessB. And there's plenty of resources on my website, it's BBusinessB.co.uk. And my YouTube channel in general will also cover areas such as BUSS4 revision in general. And some clips that directly relate to what I've covered in this topic. Please bear in mind that this year I'm not teaching BUSS4 myself. So I've just literally looped through it and tried to put you something together following the new quest I had. So I can only go as far as really what I've done within my time that I've got. And so please don't nag me and complain that I haven't given you as much as I gave you last year. I've done my best. Hopefully good luck with the exam and hopefully catch you all soon.